It's safe to say when The Girl Who Left Through Time was released in 2006, the film's director, Mamadou Hosoda's life was about to change for the better. While it wasn't an original property, still, he was able to direct a film the way he wanted to without any studio interference. Of course, with the numerous accolades this film garnered, Hosoda also had some personal accomplishments after this film came out, as well with his recent marriage, which put him in a position he never was in before, as he assumed being married would just be stifling, annoying, bothersome, but in actuality was the exact opposite. He would recall going to visit his then-girlfriend's large family and in no time got along with them. This would be one of a couple of base points which would sprout into our next film, and apparently Hosoda wasn't the only one that got the family bug. Stantako Okudera, the film screenwriter, uh, both for The Girl Who Left Through Time and this film, recently had a kid, further changing her perception of what family means, and character designers Takashi and Mina Okazaki got married while it was in production. Given the premise, there is no better spot and no better aura to surround yourself with than the one of having recently revised perceptions of what family means and how they stick together. What followed was the making of Hosoda's most career-defining film, one that would make him a bigger name in the animation world. To call it ambitious would be an understatement. If The Girl Who Left You Time was the story of an encounter, this was the story of what occurs after an encounter, a movie which shows us the way back to our roots while also moving us forward into the future. My name is Payne, and this is the Mamadou Hosoda Project, Episode 2, Summer Wars. Set in a modern utopian future, the story follows Kenji, a math prodigy and part-time moderator of Oz, a massive computer-simulated VR world which connects to practically every facet of life. We see him in the computer lab when he offers to help out the, quote, prettiest girl in school, Natsuki, by pretending to be her fiancé and meeting her large family in Ueda, who are all gathered to celebrate the 90th birthday of Natsuki's great-grandmother and head of the family, Sakai. Not too long after that, he also meets Natsuki's half-great uncle Wabiske, a computer expert who has been living in America for the past decade, away from the family, after stealing the family fortune. That night, Natsuki receives a code and ends up cracking it, only to inadvertently release a virtual AI device called Love Machine, which uses his account to cause widespread damage across Oz, putting it in a position to destroy Earth, and the only people who are able to stop it are Kenji, Takashi, Kenji's friend from school, Natsuki, and her cousin Kazuma, under the legendary avatar King Kazuma. You really think someone would do that? Just go on the internet and tell lies? As well as what I said at the beginning, literally just earlier, the creative team of Hosoda and Okudera went in the same approach, not in adapting anything just like their previous film, but in creating a world, or should I say worlds, while once again going against the grain. For one, they decided to make their next film an action film solely because Okudera has always wanted to write one, so there's that. But in terms of what would be in this new action film, ideas came pouring in when they saw numerous films at film festivals while promoting The Girl Who Left the Time, which portrayed families in the same way. And that's that they're able to convey the various problems in different parts of the world, different issues and different situations in society, which led to the decision to stray away from the Hollywood formula by having the main character not be a dude in his 30s and 40s, and at the same time stray away from the anime formula by not making it a 15 to 16 year old kid, but an entire family. 27 members to be exact of different ages different demographics, and different eras. While coming up with ideas at the beginning of production, the idea to have a virtual world was inspired by a few different kinds of rising internet technology at the time, like Mixie, uh, the Wii console, which, wow, I never thought I'd ever mention that in a video, and the recent surge of popularity in Japan of the online virtual world Second Life, which brought up another opportunity to defy expectations. In your normal action movie, there's always a character who is deemed essential towards the latter half of the movie. Characters who could explain the root of a problem and know what to do. But with the internet, who really needs that person? You can just, you can just look it up. But that's where the next idea came in. Have a third act battle where the, quote, key person 
is the family itself and have all the members' experience and wisdom be put to the test against Love Machine and Oz, which, look, I know I went on this pretty deep thing as to why the events in the story act out the way they do, but honestly, they just got the name Love Machine from a song list at a karaoke bar, but l l let's just go back on track. The world of Oz, just like everything else, was made with the idea to create something that has never been done before, combining a Haruki Murakami-esque art style with blueprints of modern architecture and avant-garde paintings of houses and bookshelves, making up a world, according to Oz designer Henri Jojo, quote, that's entertaining for girls, and even the very bright color palette, knowing how much weight my words have, considering I am not the mass appeal to this, as I just said, it's still pretty good. And with all that in mind, Summer Wars was released, ironically, towards the end of summer 2009, and was a box office and critical success, something that was credited to the fallout of the 2008 financial crisis given its themes of family values. And for the second consecutive year, about a week after its North American premiere in New York, Hosoda won his second consecutive Japanese Oscar for Best Animated Feature. Since then, the only company which really distributed this film over here was Funimation, but only for a limited release in 2010. But for anyone who wasn't able to catch it in theaters or were paying attention to Hosoda's next film, Wolf Children, in December of 2013, again, not summer, Adult Swim announced in its Toonami block that they would show the film, to which 1.36 million households did before airing again around the next year. Before I say anything, there will be spoilers in this section, so if you haven't seen the film, either turn the video off and watch it or skip to the next timestamp in the description below. In regards to the film thematically, Hosoda kinda kills two birds with one stone. Not only does it convey timeless messages such as don't let things in the past shape you into who you are in the present, and regardless of age, distance, and definitely the quantity, family always rem remains united, the film also basks in the hidden theme of past versus present, tradition versus modernity. The reason why I say he kinda kills two birds with one stone here is because he doesn't only show the hidden theme within just the family. For the majority of the film, even though the events in both the real world and Oz affect each other, they are also parallel. They don't directly connect with the exception of a couple parts. Now, obviously, the two would slowly intersperse as the film goes on. The first huge moment, especially if we're talking about the theme regarding Wabiske, the guy who's been practically shunned by the whole family for wasting their fortune. A modern solution being told in a house ripe with tradition. What is that solution? Well, he reveals to Sakai that he was the one who created Love Machine solely so he could sell to the U.S. government so he can repay the family. Now, this is where Hosoda takes this convention out for a walk, tries it out for a bit, because Sakai isn't one of those family over everyone people, because, oh, she's still pissed. She fucking swings a spear at him and tells him to fuck off, showing to him that it doesn't matter if you mess with tradition, you can't repay your way back. But the whole atmosphere and vibe of tradition is forever changed when, spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen the film and watches this part anyway, Sakai dies, and because of that, the present seeps in, first in the form of Wabuske arriving back to the house, and the family forgiving him, and later when the family decides to do something against the Love Machine, by beating it with traditional means. In this case, uh, it's at an old card game known as Koi Koi. One of the few iconic aspects of the film that was taken in when it was initially released. It kind of flip-flops with the sequence of events, but by the end, the whole dramatization of practically the cultural transition Japan is facing between traditional ideals and the ever-growing modern lifestyle, albeit not as extreme as what we see in the film, is prevalent. It's very easy to understand, given where we are today as a society full of computers, it is a very refreshing thing to express. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set. You're going surfing on the internet. Let's go! The screenplay is considerably better than it was in the previous film. It was more consistent and way better structured. It's a huge improvement. The only thing I really couldn't vibe with was Natsuki's character for most of the movie. Like, yeah, she brought Kenji here, but she doesn't really do anything until the final battle and, uh, and a little bit after that, because... Yeah, there is a romantic undertone not mentioned again until the end of the movie. That's why in the description I put romance in quotation marks because it does not show itself that often. I'm not even honestly sure anymore. On the other end though, Sakai, 
was the best character in the film. The most powerful because her connections were stronger than any social network, even though she had an old-ass phone. Her mindset is completely different compared to similar characters, and that's what made her stand out. I just loved more and more the different types of people who were at the forefront of this film, who normally don't get this chance from entire families, to the shut-in neat in Kazuma, who spends most of the movie uh, just sitting on his computer. Just like the film's ever-changing tone, the music by Akihiko Matsumoto has had to be the same way, and was able to not only convey every possible genre and emotion in the film, but combine them all at the end. The animation by Studio Madhouse led by Hiroyuki Aoyama, and the character designs by... Yoshi Kisadamoto, Evangelion, Fuli Kuli, combined together are the best part of this movie. Not only was there a distinctive quirk to every family member when you see them on screen, uh, such as the unique phrases they say, or just the everyday dialogue they tell each other, but even when they're in the background, with how they sit, stand, and move in general, it's the same thing. Part of Hosoda's stellar show-don't-tell directing style he's using again, along with the one big tracking shot of the family's shadows in the foreground of the blue sky uh, in, in the back, and how the shots are placed. Just like with The Girl Who Left You Time, Hosoda aims to shoot his anime films like a live-action film, and it works. Now, you're probably wondering when I'm going to mention it. Out of everything I was able to find for this video... Even years before I ever thought of making this project, there was one piece of information that basically everyone and their grandmother knows, which is that Summer Wars was inspired by Hosoda's 1999 short film Digimon Our War Game, portions of which would later be used in Digimon the movie the following year. This has been an ongoing thing I've kept hearing since I started following anime, and of course it started when the film came out. Really, all it's missing is uh, that soundtrack they had for the dub that, for the most part, just basically made it a product of, uh, of its time. But the reason why I'm mentioning it here and not clumping it up with that whole production section earlier is because just the mere fact Hosoda practically made the same film again goes with the film's message that you shouldn't let things in the past dictate who you are in the present, which you can argue is a part of a meta-narrative when it came to our war game, with Hosoda possibly showing us how he would have made it back then had Toei not been breathing down his neck the whole time and he had all creative control, and therefore is able to let that part of his past go, while also setting him up for the future as the next big anime director. So while this film had some issues with its script, and over time hasn't really stood the test of time in some aspects, it's still one of those films, like a number of them on this channel, where if I ever had a kid, I would have no problem showing them this movie. It's the perfect family movie about an ordinary family saving the world. What more would you want?